Contrary to popular belief, time travel is not a cerebral experience. Okay? It is not a cerebral endeavor. Hi, Rex here. So we're going to talk about time travel today. Uh, we are sitting kind of outside in a temporary structure at the moment. And yes, it is in the a.m. at the time of this recording. And I just poured a Scottish ale. Why is that? Because we are sitting in a model of a time machine that could, in fact, actually become a time machine once you understand what is really going on. Now, what are my qualifications? This is the first question most people are going to bring up. You know, your true physicists and mathematicians who really have studied time travel, those guys that have put in the decades, I think are going to find this interesting and maybe a little bit funny, okay? Uh, the rest of you will actually understand it if you grasp what I got to say here, if you can reach through the fabric of the metaphor, okay? And you will actually understand the principles of time travel, of actually traveling through time, not the mechanics in the back end of the math, but the principles of actually transversing that plane better than I think most of your mathematicians and physicists. So I have to qualify this. I'm just Rex. Um, I play the guitar. I have a defense training company. Uh, we have a Patreon channel. We do advanced concepts courses. Uh, actually, the question here, hello, Zulu class, comes from our Zulu class, one of our higher level training tiers on the Patreon page. We talk about survival concepts. Now, how the hell does time travel have anything to do with survival concepts? And why am I drinking beer in the morning in a temporary structure outside? Hmm. Yeah, well, see, that's part of it. So, actually, you guys might find this interesting. Hollywood actually understands time travel. They really do. When you read between the lines, and you're going to see it in the metaphors, what Hollywood movies got time travel down the best? Now, we had a brother come over the other day, and we're talking about this because he's got very similar background to me. And so we're almost like psychic. We can talk to each other super efficiently. And uh, we're exploring just, you know, in our memories, a lot of the themes that are presented by Hollywood movies and time travel. And man, I'm telling you what, they absolutely are resonating the function of how the flux capacitor works. What two movies are the closest to actually nailing the precepts of time travel? Interestingly enough, Back to the Future is probably your most direct one that tells you what powers the time machine. Is it a flux capacitor? You guys are going to have to look at what is actually being communicated there. What is with the 1.21 gigawatts? Why was Doc Brown so excited more than normal when he heard that number? Like it blew his mind. Was it just a really high number? Or was it specifically that one... 0.21 gigawatts is actually what makes time travel possible. Is that actually factually true? Okay. So to, to, again, to qualify here, I'm just a guitar player. I do the training stuff, but I'm also a scientist. Uh, uh, to quote Dr. Brown, I believe in Back to the Future 3, I'm a student of all sciences, <laughs> right? Um, I have won awards in physics and mathematics. I actually got some awards from NASA back in the mid-90s. When I was a kid, believe it or not, um, I'd done presentations on Minkowski two-space geometry um, and general relativity and things like that. All that being said, I'm not a physicist or a mathematician. I'm a guitar player. However, musicians, guitar players, and apparently Steven Spielberg and a couple other guys um, understand time travel. What's this on the screen? Sorry. I spilled some. I need a sip of this. I spilled some of my beer. Mmm. Yeah, that is like really good. <laughs> Want to see what it is? Scottish ale. Stones throw. Stones throw. Zulu class is like writing notes right now. Like stones throw, stones throw. Exactly. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So with that being said, I find this to be very interesting. However, the truths herein are extremely profound. It is not a cerebral experience. Now, this is just um, some work done by Mr. Minkowski, who is trying to mathematically express geometric ideas. 
Now, there are different ways to explain the universe. One way is through, you know, integers and numbers and all that stuff, algebraically, right? <laughs> Stand by for colloquialisms. So you can express the universe through numbers and algebra. Minkowski looked at the world in geometry. It's all shapes. Like when I see a large algebra equation, I just see shapes. Um, it actually explains it better. Musicians typically will see shapes too. Um, the patterns of chords, if you write that out with algebra, it is extremely, to me, it's extremely confusing to see all the algebra written out in long, long form. It's like uh, you're converting it to a less precise language when you take it away from the geometry and try to put it into some numerical format with decimal places which cannot articulate the precision of the concept near as well as just drawing a picture of a shape, right? So this is how mathematicians would attempt to explain their ideas to other mathematicians and scientists. This is actually from Minkowski. Who's Minkowski? So if you study Einstein and Minkowski, what are we talking about here? Who are we talking about here? Um, so I can't remember how to spell it. I think there's two N N's here. Herman Minkowski. I think it's a Y. Okay. Like 1864 ish to I think 1909, maybe. Okay. Herman Minkowski um, explained the universe with geometry and come up with different ways of looking at geometry. For example, in standard. Euclidean geometry, a line will take the closest path between two points. In Minkowski's two-space geometry, a line is going to take the longest possible path between two points. Um, mathematicians will sort of understand that's not super important. However, what you saw before was how he can graph fourth-dimensional space, time-space, right? And you typically have an xy-axis and then you have null lines, and then you can show two-dimensionally, fourth-dimensional space. Um, if I was to try to do it in three-dimensional, you know, representing it here. Um, see if I can do this without screwing it up. So a cone here, a cone here, okay? We have this here. We have a flat plane here. Okay, so here is a flat plane, and then you have future and past, and here's the present right here, okay? Um, this is a, you know, a photon of light, or light going into the future, going in the past, this intersects our present here. There are different ways they can use shapes and whatever to express their ideas. However, how do you actually travel through time? Do you have to be an expert in geometry and numbers and all the science kind of stuff to get it? Or do little kids actually understand it better than the smart guys? Did you know that time travel is actually already written down in its full detailed form? I was watching a bunch of TED Talks by these smart guys. They're smart. I'll give that to them who are, you know, astrophysicists and all this. And then they talk about the different paradoxes in time travel. They're trying to understand it. And their predispositions to come to the table with are actually incorrect. Okay? There have actually been time travelers in recorded history, recorded by multiple cultures thousands of years ago that have been in the future, in the past, and have walked through space. You can actually teleportation. is explained by the same thing that explains this. So all your Star Trek technology, right? In a time machine, you got teleportation. They were already explained thousands of years ago in precision. Little kids understand this. They, now, let me, let me define knowledge. Knowledge, to some, is um, a way to climb up a ladder and clobber somebody else with it. Knowledge, to others, is actually experience. So when I say knowledge, I'm saying experience. I'm not saying cerebral, writing numbers on a chalkboard, explaining all the stuff properly. Uh, when I say they have knowledge of time travel, I mean they actually fundamentally understand it into their innermost beings. Musicians might see two-dimensional representations of that or hear it in terms of frequency form, but your children and your humble and your meek are going to understand and have knowledge of time travel and teleportation 
and actually experience it in some cases where they achieve perfect alignment to step out of uh, the timeline, okay? Because you have your light goes this way through the cone deal, okay? So there's your light coming through here. If you want to step out of time, how do you do that? How do you get out of time? Let me show you something real quick. Bear with me. What's that? Hmm. Remember that movie? Okay, so out of time, how do you step out of time? Well, Dr. Emmett Brown figured it out. Marty McFly did it. What was the flux capacitor? What was the premonition? All right. I lost my little guy for the DeLorean. We can't find his little toy DeLorean. It's a really, really good little, it's like one of those $10 die cast, actual real nice toys of the, the DeLorean, right? In the movie, Back to the Future, the general procedure is that lightning comes down from above, okay? Strikes what? Strikes time, clock tower. Actually, what time was it? It was 10.04. I gotta redo that. So it was 10.04. <clears throat> Lightning actually comes down from above, strikes the clock tower, and delivers what? Through a connection, a hook, okay? A hook, okay, into the DeLorean. Okay? Empowers the flux capacitor inside here, sending it into past or the future. In this case, the future, right? So the concept is you have this delivering 1.21 gigawatts Gigawatts, actually, right, guys? We're going to use the Back to the Future nomenclature. <laughs> the, the lightning comes from above, okay? The lightning, the power, the direct light, the straight light comes from above and strikes time. And you need this, first of all. You need the lightning from above, the sword, the electric sword, the flaming sword from above. You need a hook. And you need what? Something else, this time machine, okay? Time machine. Now, there are certain languages in which this will be very obvious, ancient languages where this will be very obvious what is going on with a tiny bit of study that has been concealed from our eyes because we have been disobedient. This is a very, 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 very profound Summarization of how this works, okay? So, let's explain Minkowski edition to explain fourth dimensional time. This is a two-dimensional whiteboard, right? Here is your zero dimension, so zero D object, okay? What is perpendicular, here's the word you need to know, Perpendicular. What is perpendicularity? When you, once you understand perpendicularity, you're going to understand time travel better. This is your zero dimension. So let me draw this. It's a zero, not an O. Okay. What's per perpendicular to that? Well, over here, take this point, stretch it out over here. Now you have a line. Okay, this is your one-dimensional object, 1D, one okay? So a line is perpendicular to a point. What's perpendicular to a line? What dimension would you extrapolate out here? You take these two and you pull them out like this. Pull the line here, now you have a square. This is 2D. Roger? Okay, so Minkowski addition. Now, what's perpendicular to all four of these? 
each of these vertexes, you have to stretch out again. So we got one here, one here, one here, one here, and what do we got? What is this? Oh, hold on. <laughs> Gosh darn it, here we go. This way. You have a 3D cube. What's perpendicular to a 3D cube? These are the three physical dimensions that we can perceive right now, that we can experience. What's three-dimensional? How can you step out of this three-dimensional universe in such a way that you can go perpendicular to time and step off the timeline and index your way through? Now, actually, interesting, there was another movie that's more modern that nailed it pretty good. It's called Interstellar, I think, um, where they demonstrate like a pretty good picture of what four and 5D space looks like to look at the timeline from outside of it, stepping into 5D space. That's what we're talking about here. They actually nailed it very well too. Man, I'd like to know, I'd like to sit down and drink some wine with these guys who made these movies. Cause like, I want to ask them where they, who the hell wrote the script? Who is putting it? Cause like there's details in a lot of these movies that are very symbolic that go back to the ancient source of knowledge and I'd like to wonder if they're resonating it unwittingly as a person fulfilling their duty in where they fit into the space-time matrix, okay? Because that happens. They're resonators of the instructions of the time machine. Or if they actually know what they're doing. That's very, very interesting to me. I'd love to do that. Ah. How, what's perpendicular to a three-dimensional cube? Okay, and draw another one. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Get the idea? Okay, tesseract. So each one of these vertexes attaches to the other points. That's terrible. <laughs> but each one of these connects with the other one, right? So this is a four cube or a tesseract. Now you'll see that theme, that's so terrible I can't stand to look at it. Although it could absolutely be contorted and twisted like this because when you see them visually represented, it doesn't make sense this way. This folds inside of itself. You ever play Cats in the Cradle with the strings? How you turn the box and the inside to the box and the outside and then they wrote certain songs about it. The cats in the cradle and the silver moon. Yeah. Do musicians understand time travel? Or are they just resonating it unwittingly? Because they're going to get... The, the instruction maker of time travel is getting their, his mileage out of it one way or the other. Okay? So, 4D space, right? Now, what's perpendicular to 4D space, 5D space? Interestingly, when you look at the Minkowski edition, if you want to understand and convert it to decimal form, you take zero dimension and you get rid of that. Get the one dimension, you get the root of that. And you can display these very easily. There are five dimensions in the way that we perceive dimensions. There's actually more dimensions if you include things like frequency from other angles and values and physics dimensions, um, things like that. The first three dimensions and the zero dimension, right, are basically what we're familiar with now. You have another one that is time. You have another one which is kind of a mystery. This is the key to time travel. When you step perpendicular to time, each one of these is perpendicular to the ones next to it, right? When you step perpendicular to the timeline, which we are stuck in our timeline right now, you cannot get off of it. There is a physical dimension that we are un. Oh, we're actually, children are not unaware of this, but when you start reducing this into zero, one, two, three, four, and try to write it down in numbers, you can do it. What's the root of five? Okay. It's going to, if you actually get the values here, this will take you straight to the instructions for the time machine, literally. It'll point specifically to the actual instructions of how to travel through time, how to build a time machine, how the time machine has already been built and utilized in structions. 
write those numbers down, get the value. It will take you straight to the instructions and it will tell you how to step off of the fourth dimensional timeline, right? Let's do it in another way. Dr. Emmett Brown style. So here's the timeline. Now, time, when you're stuck in the timeline, goes forward. Now, if you understand relativity, um, it can only go backwards if you exceed the speed of light, which is also possible if you understand the same deal. But we have um, 1955, right? We have 1985, and then what do we have? 2015, right? So what is this, 30 years? That time machine I drew earlier, okay? You have the lightning from above, you have the clock being struck, you have the hook. So here's what you need for time travel. You need 1.21 gigawatts being delivered via a hook, okay? Or a connecting device of some kind to power your what? Your time machine. So this is value 30 but it's also another value, which is so specific, it will tell you exactly what the time machine is, and we'll get to that in a second. So you need a hook. We have a clue here that 30 year jumps represented in the movie Back to the Future are explaining um, another source of this. This is a staff of instruction. Just write that in there. <laughs> this is the staff of instruction, guys. What is the staff of instruction? What is it? And you'll understand the DeLorean and the hook powering the thing. It will be completely obvious. The entire cultures taught this to their children for thousands of years. You probably were taught it. Hmm? So, you're stuck in the timeline. So what does the time machine do? You skip over the moment in time. You ever notice the clocks when Dr. Emmett Brown is doing the experiment at first, you can see that the stopwatches switch to a one, two, one on both of them, okay? They start at a certain time, they end at a certain time. That's another clue paralleling this. Plus you can look at the Twin Pines Mall. You can see how when you take the Twin Pines Mall signs, uh, flip it upside down, connect, to, connect that to the general theme of the movie of the attacks that happen against the Twin Pines Mall, how Marty flies through and touches the screen, touches the monolith, very similar to 2001 Space Odyssey, and he transverses through time. You can see jumping 30 years in the future and 30 years in the future again, and you can look at other things. Zemeckis published and released in 2015, connected to the Twin Pines Mall incident. Here, about two giant towers being hooked together by cables being connected with hooks and wires. The themes are absolutely being screamed out under the water, under the water, okay? So the time machine, so how, how in the hell does a movie like Back to the Future actually predict the future in the movie with deadly precision? If you do not know what I'm talking about, scroll around just a little bit more. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go on that one, but I've noticed that um, I think it was back in 2015 is when I noticed that. It was like, holy smokes. When it, when, the, when it clicks, it clicks. It really does. So the time machine has to, you're stuck in life. We walk on the timeline, right? You walk here, you walk here, you grow up, you get older, and then you get older here. And you started off as a baby like this. So you get grow, and then you get older, and then you die, and then your progeny continue, right? So that's the timeline. We're stuck in the timeline. How do you go back? How do you help your children in the future and go back and help your father or your grandfather in the past? What is the solution to properly operating the time machine? Interestingly, in order to step off the timeline, you have to traverse perpendicular to the fourth dimension. So Marty can jump from here to here to here or what the hell happened here. So they were 1985, 
went back to 1955, then they went to 2015. Biff went back here, screwed it up, created an alternative timeline that was terrible, etc. right? So how do you step off the timeline and jump back into it? To literally, you have to literally, literally perpendicularly traverse the fourth dimension and just, you can do it. How do you do it? You have to perceive five dimensional space. What is this? The 1.21 is the hugest clue there is. The hook and the staff of instruction is the DeLorean. That's a clue. It's actually way more clear than that, way more profound. I man to release that one publicly. <laughs> I will quote Albert Einstein for you guys when he was asked um, where he got his equations from because he had some profound observations on the universe, didn't he? Remember that? E equals MC squared. I think it was in 1955. He was drinking rum with his bros. His bros, he was drinking some rum, right? <laughs> and um, here's to you, Albert. I'm going to have another one. Mm. 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 Yummy, yummy. That is yummy. I will admit it. He was drinking bros and he, he spilled the beans on where he got E equals MC squared. He says, hey, I got it from one of those books you guys don't like so much. And they're like, what? He's like, it's in your Bible. And they said, what? He's like, yeah, well, show us where. He says, no, you don't deserve to know what part until you go and look at it, find it for yourself. I'll give you guys a further clue. It is in the first chapter. First chapter. So the first verse explains it. <laughs> the first verse explains all thermodynamics with precision, mathematical precision. If you understand that wasn't written in Shakespearean English, right? Furthermore, um, you can actually look at the, the study of this. The, the straight light from above. Tear that word apart and it will tell you how to build a time machine. Literally. And it's absolutely echoed in Hollywood's, uh, it's in the Star Wars movies, the Peregrills or whatever those flying space whales are. It's in Star Trek Episode Four with Spock giving his blessing, delivering with the waters in transparent aluminum, space whales to save the future from judgment. It's um, in the new animated series in Star Wars. It's in Back to the Future. It is really straightforward with this part giving you the actual, kind of revealing the author of the instructions. Also, um, interestingly, there is a movie, Donnie Darko, where they, it's probably the most blatant place I've seen it explained, was when Donnie Darko, it's a scary movie, don't let your kids watch it. Yeah, there's bad stuff in there. Uh, Donnie Darko and his science teacher, because right, he's freaking out. He's seeing all this stuff play out, and he's just like trying to understand what's going on. Him and his science teacher have a talk, and in that one minute and 20 seconds of their talk, or whatever it is, science teacher nails it. And Donnie Darko and the science teacher basically explain how to step off the timeline. Now, people are going to look at that and get grumpy. Your physicists are going to look at that, and because of what... They are blind, man. They're not going to see it. You are either a student of science and a student of the natural world, or you are a student of your own damn propaganda. And your inactivity leads to your pride and your ego, right? We put so much stock into how damn smart we are, what our papers are. Dude, I've won the competitions. I was a good science student. I got formally trained, all that stuff. I am here to tell you, man, they're not any smarter than anyone else. And I'm not smarter than you. And guess what? Being smart is the obstacle to understanding true Minkowski space-time. What did Minkowski and Einstein have in common? They're both trying to explain things with humility and pointing. You know that Einstein and Minkowski both basically straight up were honest with this stuff and where it came from. 
Nobody wanted to hear it. Nobody wrote it down. Because they didn't like it. Because you see, that doesn't make them look awesome. It doesn't make them look awesome, so they don't want nothing to do with it. So what are you going to do? Children will understand this because they don't have this freaking giant, huge, giant wall obstructing their path of true knowledge. Knowledge, not in the way that you would define it, which is your knowledge trophy you polish and put on your smart guy office shelf thing of how damn smart we all are, right? I got a big library next to me with a lot of books. Um, and like, has nothing to do with being smart. A child executes better than we do, right? Now there's, I've read a lot of work corroborating this, what I'm talking about from a different angle, from some very famous quantum physicists who also study other aspects of the universe. You cannot study this dimension mathematically and geometrically by stepping away from the staff of instruction in how the universe is actually put together. It's all totally, absolutely predefined. Want me to summarize in general form for you guys? If you want to help your dad in the past, if you want to help your children in the future, you're going to need a time machine to do that sometimes. Get it? Sometimes. So you can step out of time and have perfect timing and absolutely do that. Okay. Look at how many times this was highlighted in those movies. And I'm sure Spielberg and Christopher Zeus Lloyd absolutely were in cahoots and playing this out so well on how excited he got with the 1.21. He just shocked. He like put his hand on his head because he was, and then he talks about that's too much power. We can't generate that kind of power. No, you can't generate this kind of power. Did you know mankind cannot generate this kind of power? It only comes from one spot. Hmm? A bolt of lightning. Now, did you know that intelligent people have communicated for thousands of years using meta four, right? I'm going to write like a doctor. I'm sorry. <laughs> they use metaphor. They use typology. Hmm? Are you guys cool with metaphor and typology? They use music and art to communicate concepts that are too complex to put in digital form. This is the digital form. This will get you to the point. But if you want the full instructions, you have to understand how these different concepts are truly viewed. It's drawing a picture. Ge geometry is drawing a picture of the, the relationships between numbers. Geometry is also like when, when you do a play on a concept, Back to the Future is utilizing three-dimensional geometry of extremely complex biological systems objects. You know, it's interesting that I find this wood car on my table here. Little guy was playing in here. Here's your DeLorean. What's different between this and the stainless steel? This is organic. This is actually more um, correct. Okay? Organic. An old guy at the gas station handed this to my little guy. Says, you want something? And I was like, wait a minute here. And then because I guard, you know, I guard the family. And I came over there, read him, and he handed him this. And I thought, oh, that's cool. Some old guys are old school, aren't they? He handed him this car. So my little guy thinks this is a time machine car, which is a good model. Very similar to what Dr. By the way, Dr. Emmett Brown utilized what, you know, to get his point across? Wood models, right? Does it have to be a metal object? Yes, but what kind of metal? Hmm? Which brings us to our next point. What kind of metal is it? Aluminum, actually. Oxygen. Here's the construction. If you want the proper construction. Star Trek, Star Wars, all that stuff utilizes all this. 
but this is actually reality. So this is probably you're viewing me through this right now. It's transparent metal. This is where the instructions are written upon this. The instructions were literally written into transparent metal. It's a mineral. And when it's in its perfectly clear form, it's like a glass window. It's like as clear as the blue sky itself. And the instructions and the art and the music and the beauty and full in its full sym symmetry were written into this structure here thousands of years ago. It is very, very simple. Very simple. Little kids get it. If you, you know how you step, you know how a time machine actually works? Marty's desire and love to assist his and help, right? At first he was escaping, but he wanted to help his parents and then he wanted to help his kids, right? That's part of a clue that steps you out the timeline. And you can see this in, this, what's that new, um, uh, or Avengers where the guy punches the space whale and the whales are coming from space. By the way, there's the, the waters above, the waters below. These themes, and they're delivering the Tesseract, and they the whole mythology in that stupid movie, which I never noticed when I watched it when I used to work in the oil field. One of these guys I worked with, his name was Dr. Wiggly. He's a chemist, he's a PhD. And um, we both worked in the, the lab. That I was a geologist with him. And um, he wanted to watch this Avengers. And he, like, was very strange. He's, maybe it's because he was out there, like, nine months without a day off. <laughs> Couldn't even see his family for nine months. This well had such problems. And um, we went and watched the Avengers one day when they're chipping pipe because the pipe broke down. Or the MD, MWD tool broke down. We went out and watched the Avengers. And, man, did he make a big deal out of that flying space whale. So I watched this movie and I never even under. I'm just thinking it's a stupid cartoon, which it is. It is a stupid cartoon. It's loaded in heathenism and paganism and whatever you want to call it. But the themes that they, like, it's like everyone has access to these instructions. But what direction on the timeline are you going to step off? Because you can affix yourself to your timeline more thoroughly and entrench yourself into it. Or you can step off of the timeline. Okay? And how do you traverse through teleportation through space? The instructions are all the same. Very interesting. I, I will explain more on the, the overt, the overt reality which tells you exactly what the mechanics and instructions are to literally step off the timeline and the historical accounts of where guys actually did that and walked into the fifth dimension and disappeared. Never seen them again with witnesses, okay? How people can appear in a room deliver a message and then just walk out of time, walk out of space. And sometimes, yes, they did travel through time with witnesses, num like recorded in some of the most trusted history records in the world. So we'll talk about that more on the Patreon channel, but I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a, little bit of a deal here and answer the question. And this is for my Zulu students, actually. I'm gonna post this one online for you guys. This one's being posted online. Okay, for the Zulu students, I want you guys to ask the question because you're so close and I think you intellectually understand what I'm talking about when I talk about stepping off the timeline. How do you traverse perpendicular to the timeline and step through into that, that fifth dimensional space? What literally do you have to do? Just simplify. You guys are thinking too much. You guys are trying to like come up with numbers. You're, you're watching TED Talks or whatever the hell. And those guys, gosh darn it. I mean, some of them are pretty smart, but they're not as smart as Einstein was. Stephen Hawking kind of gets the idea, but he's, he's absolutely stuck in this. Okay? He's stuck in the freaking pipe. You ain't going to see it. You can't see stuff if you close your eyes to it. Okay? You can't see stuff if you close your eyes to it. So... For those of you that are <laughs> the mathematicians, the physicists, the engineers that uh, pick up what I'm laying down, because you're, you know, it's interesting. There's a relationship which is per is art and music perpendicular to engineering. It is, but between the two of them, you have the full relationship of a, the creative inventor. An inventor has to be both an artist. A musician or or musician, right? And what else? What else does an inventor have to be? 
is to be somewhat of an engineer. He has to understand the reality of the universe. Those of you that are engineers, artists, and understand both of those two uh, dimensions there, intellectually, will understand this is not a cognitive endeavor. You will pick up on what I'm laying down. And for those of you, I welcome you. You might have a lot of fun over with us on Patreon. Uh, we talk about this overtly all the time on all tiers, um, continuously. And if you find this to be entertaining, I bid you, well, I'm going to finish this. And then why, again, why am I doing this? Because I'm in my time machine. And I'm commanded in this time machine to do this. <laughs> you guys are awesome. All right, may the Schwartz be with you. Rex out.